Well, our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter. I'll read verses 30 through 37. Uh, that's on page 1012 in the regular Bible, as Joe said. And in the extra special Bible, that's on page 1539. And you can look on with me if you care to. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you would think this would be a pretty harmless sermon. I belong, I serve, and I'll talk about the ways in which we can serve, and won't that be nice, and we all agree we ought to serve. Um, But this is actually, there's some some really treacherous territory to go through here, and at some point I may make you feel uncomfortable. I'm going to feel uncomfortable for a lot of it, because in order to belong, in order to serve, we also have to deal with the fact that we don't always like to serve, or we don't like the way other people serve, or we don't like to serve in the way that other people seem to want us to. And it makes us uncomfortable. I remember, I don't remember the transition very well, but what I remember is a time when if I did anything to help my parents, that was celebrated. Oh, isn't it great? Oh, isn't he a good little helper? A good little helper is what we wanted to be. And it was, everyone's so excited. And then, I don't remember the in-between time, but then I remember the time when it was expected that I would do stuff. And that wasn't exciting at all. And um, like, I guess, I, well, it's been passed down to me and to Wendy, my parents weren't great about allowance, like remembering to give it to their children. And one of the reasons for that was they were convinced that children ought to do chores to help out around the house because they were part of the family. And they were more or less convinced that we ought to get some sort of allowance when it was convenient for them. But we were absolutely not going to be paid to do things that we were supposed to do, which once upon a time were really exciting and now weren't exciting at all. And don't try to negotiate for a little pay for sweeping the patio when to belong to this family. If you're part of this family, then you will do some of these things. I just remember where all of a sudden serving, helping wasn't fun anymore at all. And I didn't like it. And there was really very little incentive. And it's not always incentive to say, well, you're part of the family, so this is what you do. And it's not always incentive to tell your kids that these are the things they're supposed to do. I told you they should get a little nervous in the children's lesson. Um, And I'm not really going to throw them under the bus at all. Because if they are not as quick and willing to do the thing, the very, very few things that they're expected to do, it's probably mostly my fault. I haven't got the incentive thing down. Because that's really what I want to talk about. This gospel passage is fascinating. Great things happening. Jesus is back in his home area, near his hometown, but he's sneaking around because he's got things to tell his disciples. But they don't get it, and they're too scared to ask him about it. And then when they have their own conversations, that doesn't go well. And he asked them what they were talking about, and they were scared because they don't get it, and they don't want to tell him. And then he talks about this little child, and whoever welcomes one of these little children welcomes me. That's all great stuff, but it really has to do with this me-first conversation they were having uh, that kind of intrigues me. Because it happens in the family, and it happens in organizations, and it happens in the church. Who's doing the most, and therefore the most important? Who is not pulling their share? Who is not doing what they're supposed to be doing? Because in the end, it may, may not have talked about tasks and responsibilities, but that's the heart of it. Who is the greatest among the 12? Well, who's the most important? Who does the most? Who can we not do without? And they had it all exactly wrong. To share, to be part of the family means to share, but to be part of the family means to serve. To belong means to serve. That's part of what we do. And the disciples were going about it really, really backwards. The word servant, or the word we translate servant, shows up in the New Testament 
57 times. And the verb to serve or some form of it shows up 58 times just in the New Testament. Pretty important part of what God is trying to teach us about following Jesus, that's the Gospels, and being the church, that's everything after Acts essentially, um, how it is that we're to, well, Acts 2, um, how we are to be the church evidently has a lot to do with serving and to be a servant. And we're not necessarily wild about that. We're much better at who's the first, who's the greatest, where is the pecking order, and how does it fall out, and who fits exactly where. Me first versus me last. Jesus said that we must be last of all and servant of all if we want to be first. And like I said, I don't know how to work that out. Um, Because I don't know if you get penalized for knowing the rules, and therefore he says, all right, make a line here, and I go back to the back. No, no, please, after you. No, please, please, after you. Really after you. Because I want to be the dead last, because then I'll get to be first. I don't know if... God knows and goes, yeah, that was a good try, but you're in the middle. Um, You don't get anything, the worst or the best. I don't know how it works out, but I know that the me first attitude that is so natural to us. I want to do things my way. I want to do them in my time. I want to do them the way that I do them is not the way of the kingdom. And it's not the way of belonging. Some of you also are uh, watchers of the crime show Blue Bloods. I enjoy so many things about Blue Bloods. Tom Selleck plays the police commissioner. Lots of great people, interesting stories, wonderful uh, conversation about the family uh, that goes on in the context of police people in New York City. Um, but there was a recent episode where Frank, the police commissioner, Tom Selleck's character, is arguing with his director of public information, uh, this deputy commissioner for public information. They argue a lot. Uh, but in this case, it had to, be, it had to do with something that was supposed to be done in a certain way. And the commissioner was convinced it was not being done the way it was supposed to be done. And uh, his public information person was trying to get him to see because it was a spat with the mayor and maybe we can do things in a different way. And they get arguing about this and uh, the commissioner says, no, it's got to be done in a certain way. And Garrett, his, his deputy, says, well, you mean your way. And the commissioner says, I mean the right way. <laughs> and this is my, I don't have very many issues with Tom Selleck's character. I'm a little worried about him, which is funny to be worried about a TV character. But I'm a little worried about him. I really think he should have retired, and he didn't. Um, but I really think he should because I'm concerned about this attitude He's not wrong in that episode. He's not wrong. In this case, the right way also happened to be the way he wanted it to be done. But I'm not sure he's always got his compass set exactly right about these things. Because this is how we feel. The way I want it to be done is the right way. How are we going to do this? Well, we should do it this way. Well, I think we should do it this way. Well, if you want to do it the wrong way, we can do it that way. If you want to do it right, because my way is the right way. Now, there are certain areas... Two, I can think of in this world where if you cared, I could show you the right way to do it. Raking leaves is one. I'm a killer leaf raker. I've got a system. It's the right system. It will get it done fast. It's the best way. There was another. Oh, it's not true, but I think it's driving. If the other drivers would just listen, I could tell them the right way to do things. Because I'm sure when they're doing it wrong... And I tell them less about that now because I've got somebody who's about to be driving now. So I try to keep my mouth shut more than before. You mean your way. I mean the right way. Well, yeah, but your way and the right way seem to be equal in your mind, but they're not in everybody else's. And that's a problem in a family, and it's a problem in an organization, and it's certainly a problem in the church as well. What is the right way to do it? It's not always my way. Me first church membership can lead to all kinds of really unhealthy things happening within the church. It damages our mission. It uh, taints the gospel, the good news that we're trying to proclaim and live out. I told you about this book that I've been looking at these last few weeks called I Am a Church Member. It's a short little book by a man who was a pastor. Now he's a researcher and uh, president of Lifeway uh, Christian Resources. But he does have a team that does surveys and things. And he surveyed some churches He's not specific about how he figured out which churches um, he wanted to to check in with. But what he did find, um, he did a survey of churches that were really inwardly focused. And an inwardly focused church of people who hear the Great Commission go 
and make disciples of all nations. But if we're inwardly focused, then we're messed up on the Great Commission at the very least. Uh, But also inwardly focused churches, all about me, all about us, become churches that are self-serving instead of serving the kingdom or serving others. So he came up with some behavior patterns of churches that are inwardly focused, therefore self-serving. Dominant behavior patterns. One, the top one that he put here is worship wars. There are books, that's a, that's a title of a book, Worship Wars. And I think there's Worship Wars 2, which is not a great sequel. Because the point is that when it comes to my way is the right way, churches end up getting split over things like what sort of music is appropriate to sing in worship and what should not be allowed. In the best situations, you do all kinds of different music, but in other situations, it's my way or the highway, and people will go to fight over music. One or more factions of the church want the music just the way they like it, and any change or deviation is met with anger. Worship wars. Hey, this one, this one, I am pretty sure is not my fault, but uh, this is the one that makes me most uncomfortable. And it's the worst title ever, Prolonged Minutia Meetings which doesn't make sense, but I know what he means. The church spends an inordinate amount of time in different meetings, and most of the meetings deal with the most inconsequential items, while the Great Commission and Great Commandment are rarely the topics of discussion. Well, I may have been to a meeting or two that that could be said of, but it feels like what we're doing is important. But the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, rarely come up. Facility focus is the third one that can get you in trouble. Church facilities develop iconic status. One of the highest priorities in the church is the protection and preservation of rooms, furniture, and other visible parts of the church's buildings and grounds. This is um, in some ways more pronounced in the South than up here. Uh, By that I mean my church growing up, and I was there from the time I can remember until I graduated high school, and then sometimes in college I was going back and forth, but mostly for those first 18 years. There was a church parlor. I don't know what happened in the church parlor because children were generally not allowed in there. You could see it through the window. You couldn't go in. Some events would be in there, but they didn't really want us there. I don't know what they did in the parlor, but it was very nice. The furniture was very nice. Everything was kept up very nicely, and I wasn't supposed to go in there. And then... I get to be an almost adult. I'm in college, and the church we're going to also has a parlor. Then I graduate from college, so I'm really pretty close to being an adult. And uh, I find out that they're talking about doing new furniture in the parlor of this church in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, there were people who had very strong feelings about what kind of furniture ought to go in the parlor. And then when I... Wendy and I were on the youth group leadership team when we thought, oh, there's a meeting, a smaller meeting, not the whole youth group. It'd be perfect to hold in the parlor... We found out we were wrong. It wasn't the perfect place to take teenagers. They weren't so sure about that. Facility focus. Uh, Program driven, which actually sounds good. I mean, most uh, church growth strategies say you have to have programs. The problem is not that you have programs. Every church has a program, even if you don't talk about it that way. But once you start doing ministry in a certain way, then that becomes the program. And then when the program is the end and not a means to ministry, then you get stuck. An inwardly focused budget, a budget that's all about us, our needs and comforts as members, and not actually outside the walls, uh, reaching beyond and outreach and evangelism, that's a problem. Inordinate demands for pastoral care. I'd like to skip over that pretty quickly, but I will tell you this. It can happen. I'll read it. I'll read it. Um, All church members deserve care and concern, especially in times of need and crisis. Absolutely true. Problems develop, however, when church members have unreasonable expectations for even minor matters. One of my clerks of session in North Carolina said, David, here's the thing. Sweet people in this church. There are some people in this church that if they get a hangnail, they think they need to see the pastor. You ought to be there because there's a hangnail. And in the other church... The clerk of session and various session members are trying to figure out how often the pastor ought to go visit everybody. And there were people there that thought I ought to go see everybody probably about every week, which is impossible, uh, but maybe every month. And then an elder who said to me, and he loved me, he was a friend, he said, David, if I don't call you, don't come. (laughs) Well, that's great, but now what do I do? Do I go see everybody monthly and make really upset the people who want to see me weekly and really upset the ones who are like, if I don't call, you don't come or do. And it was a very difficult conversation. 
I didn't go see the people with hangnails, though, because they don't tell me that. They just should, they think I should know that they have a hangnail. So that's inordinate demands. And that's not just pastors, by the way. That's deacons. That's elders, too. That can hurt a church. Attitudes of entitlement. This is a really tricky thing in the church. This issue could be a catch-all for many of these points. The overarching attitude is one of demanding and having a sense of deserving special treatment. Entitlement will kill a church. Greater concern about change than the gospel, which is funny because the gospel is all about change, right? The gospel transforms us, transforms lives. It takes a dead person and makes them alive. It takes Saul and makes him Paul. And yet when change comes about in the church, we usually get pretty upset about change. Oh, I don't know about change. We don't like change. Gospel is all about change. Interesting. Or the way he put it, any noticeable in the changes in the church evoke the ire and anger of many But those same passions are not evident about participating in the work of the gospel to change lives. And then two two last ones. Anger and hostility. If if members are consistently angry, uh, this is a self-serving and inwardly focused church. And finally, apathy about evangelism. If we are not caring about people coming to faith in Christ, then that's a church that's inwardly focused and self-serving. That's a problem. And it has nothing to do with what either Jesus or Paul said the church was supposed to be about. We will never find joy. This is Tom Rainer again, the same guy. We will never find joy in church membership. He expects that we will. He expects that it is possible for us to find joy in being a member of the church, in belonging to the church, belonging not just to God and Jesus Christ, but belonging to each other. But we'll never find joy in church membership when we're constantly seeking things to be done our way. But paradoxically, we will find joy, great joy, When we choose to be last, me last instead of me first can bring great joy. Well, that's, that's the me first problem. The me last issue was laid out for us pretty clearly in the Philippians passage that Joe read. Now, this is interesting because um, he's talking about Jesus, right? The one who was Lord of the universe, emptied himself of everything, of his glory, didn't consider equality with God something to hang on to or something to be used to his own advantage, but he emptied himself, became nothing, and the word, the eternal word of God, becomes flesh and dwells among us and gets hungry and tired and disappointed and hurt and finally suffers and dies. But the reason Paul tells them this, writes this, it's, it's called the hymn to Christ, that little section there uh, about being found in appearance as a man, that whole section. The whole reason he gives them that, the, the church at Philippi wasn't really one of his problem churches. Corinth, they were a problem. Philippi, he had to keep telling them to rejoice, but presumably they were doing some of that already. But the problem they had is that they weren't like-minded They weren't pulling equally together. Uh, They were getting into trouble because they weren't putting others ahead of themselves. And so Paul tells them about Jesus in order to tell them about how they do the church together. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, he assumes you'll have a lot of encouragement. Being Being united with Christ is the whole thing. If we are united with Christ, then we are united with him in his death, and we're united with him in his resurrection, and we are going to be united with him face to face one day. Everything hangs on union with Christ. So he assumes we'll be encouraged by that. If you have any comfort from his love, he assumes you'll have a lot of comfort from God's love for you in Christ. Any common sharing in the Holy Spirit, that's an amazing thing. You share the Holy Spirit together. All these things. Then make my joy complete. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be one in spirit. Be of one mind. And then the practical stuff. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's the sense of entitlement. That's the me first attitude. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. In other places, Paul just says, put others ahead of yourselves. In Philippians, he says, value others above yourselves. Consider them more valuable. Don't look to your own interests, but look to the interests of of others. That's how we do the church. And if you want to know how to do that, let me tell you a little about Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, and he's laid in a manger in Bethlehem, and people rejected him and despised him. And here he is preaching the good news of salvation, and most turn away. Not just about Jesus and his example, well, and, and what he did for us, but also it is an example for us to follow in this case. We can't hang on the cross to save the world. But we can empty ourselves. We can value others above ourselves. We can look to others' interests ahead of our own. And we can become the church. Not just what Jesus did, but what we are to do too. 
How do we serve? Well, there are lots of ways. We have different gifts. We saw that the very first week. And in service, by the way, you should really play to your strengths. Uh, a presbytery a year ago, a friend of mine was preaching on a kind of obscure Exodus passage about these folks you don't hear much about, uh, Bezalel and, oh, I can't remember Bezalel's buddy. But anyway, these guys are building the tabernacle and all the things to go along with it. And my friend said, the thing is, not everybody was good at making things. And not everybody was good at weaving. Not everybody was good at carpentry. Not everybody was good at overlaying with gold. There's a reason we have different gifts. But we should, as the people of God, we're better. That's the way he put it. We're better when the people of God play to their strengths. We don't have to do everything, particularly not in our area of giftedness. But he does assume that we're going to do something. So not practical today. Here are the things you can do to serve. But practical, and I think the most important sense, how it is that we go about serving. Not demanding my way because it's the right way, even though we all think it is. Uh, not demanding a entitlement and demanding special treatment and demanding special turf, whatever else it may be. But one of the ways we belong, one of the ways we serve, and one of the ways we show that we're children of God is valuing others ahead of ourselves, going to the back of the line instead of the first, being willing for others to cut in line ahead of us, and not think horrible things about them. Seeking to do things together. Our way, maybe. Not my way. Not a me first thing. We can do this because we are now the children of God. If we belong to Christ, we have been changed. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old is gone. Paul knows it's not all gone. Or else we wouldn't demand our own ways and our own rights. But the new has come. And he's calling us to live into the new. To belong, to serve, to live and love and forbear and forgive as Jesus Christ did and as he calls us to. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, help us to belong and help us to serve you and to serve the church and to serve one another. And to serve people outside our walls. And help us to do it when that's really hard for us. We don't want to do things other people's way, and we want people to do things our way. We want to have our place and our spot. We want to have the recognition that we want in the way that we want it, and we forget what we're all about. Lord, for this congregation, help us not to turn in on ourselves, but rather to turn out with good news, with love, with hearts and minds ready to serve those in need around us. We do take care of ourselves really well. Help us to continue to care for the body of Christ, but help us also to care for those for whom Christ came to die. Uh, This world which you are in, uh, the work and the process of redeeming. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.